Joshua Barnwell was at the mall shopping with a friend when the shooting began. He's a Navy combat veteran with training in emergency care for wounded people, which he put to use on Saturday. I talked to him just a few minutes ago, right before airtime, and we want you to hear from him what he saw and what he did. And I just want to tell you some of the details. They're gut-wrenching. But he and we want you to hear them because it's what was done to our fellow human beings. It's what was done to women and children and men. And it happened, and it's real. And ignoring it, it just doesn't feel like the right thing to do. Joshua, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, first of all, how are you doing? I mean, you have been through something which is just horrific. Uh, given the circumstances, I mean, I could comfortably say I'm doing good, um, you know, considering all this occurred. I know you were there when shooting began. You heard it. Um, you hit out in a, in a Lucky Jeans store. Uh, you made sure the people around you were, were down, keeping, uh, keeping as safe as possible. At a certain point, you made the decision it was, it was safe to come out, and you went directly to where you believe the gunfire had come from. from. When you got there, what did you see? So uh, when I initially got in front of the H&M store, it was uh, the first thing that I noticed was the, the bl gunshot blasted windows to that store. And then as I started to uh, you know, rotate around and observe, the next thing I noticed was uh, in an alcove area where there was a, uh, a landscaped uh, flower bed, if you will, I noticed in front of it was a uh, woman who had, you know, collapsed on top of herself and had uh, had perished there. And uh, then I turned around and or turned, you know, turned my gaze towards the left. And I noticed a, um, a gentleman there who was, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, writhing in pain. Uh, he had uh, what appeared to be a uh, shoulder wound. Um, he was actually in the flower bed. Uh, there was a uh, young child, uh, you know, my guess at the time was between six and eight years old that was lying there. Uh, her state was unknown but did not look uh, promising. And then next to her was an adult woman who had multiple, multiple uh, vicious uh, gunshot wounds. Uh, she had a, the head of a young lady draped on her uh, left shoulder uh, facing downward, who also appeared to have multiple very traumatic injuries and gunshot wounds. Um, then um, at the foot of that young lady was a, basically a pile with a man on top uh, who was again writhing in pain with what appeared to be uh, a shoulder or a chest wound and below him was uh, a deceased woman uh, that come to later find out his wife. And then he had a young child with him, maybe five or six years old, that was uh, just drenched uh, in blood. I mean, the color of whatever fabric he was wearing was nearly indistinguishable. And he uh, was, you know, hiding, uh, but appeared uh, at that time to not be, uh, wounded or at least not severely wounded um so yeah that was the initial observation of the scene before i actually started to involve myself and and, and you decided i mean it, it, your training at that point i assume kicks in you decide to i essentially what do triage and go to where you think you're needed most you went to the woman and and her daughter correct that's correct. That's correct, sir. I, uh, I I went over there because she had, uh, you know, made sounds, words, and so I went to her, and I approached her, and I started to, to to kind of overlook, you know, her condition and speak with her, and she asked me to um, to look at her daughter who was next to her, the young child. So I turned over to the daughter, and I began to do chest compressions and uh, some mouth to mouth, and then I went back to continue chest compressions, at that which time the, uh, just a, a vile amount of blood came out from underneath her, from her back. And I realized at that point uh, with her coloring and that state that she had uh, already been deceased. And um, you know, that the blood loss was just unbelievable. So I then returned back to, uh, 
to her mother and just tried to uh, analyze the wounds, check out the bleeding. Uh, she had a pretty large uh, portion of her neck that had been compromised, uh, both of her legs, her arm that was visible, both with just massive, atrocious bullet wounds to the point where the, the bone was splintered and, you know, the, the tissue was, was everywhere on the walls, etc. And But she was talking with me, and my main thing was to keep her stable, keep her daughter, who also was making movement and trying to contain to keep them stable, and just try to apply pressure and minimize any more loss that we could get. I mean, I had no tools. Uh, I'm not a, a trained medic, um, so I was just going with what training I do have and doing the best that I could while we were waiting for... Uh, trained medical technicians to arrive so that we could get them off to uh, to a hospital. And that mother was asking about... I mean, I about, did continue to try to... That mother was asking yeah, about I her daughter. Yeah, I eventually had to... Yeah, and eventually I tried to uh, buy time because I didn't want to have to tell her, but eventually I realized that I couldn't... Uh, there was no way around it, so I had to, to tell her that uh, that I couldn't work on her daughter anymore because her daughter was deceased but that I needed her to, uh, to hang in there because her husband was there and, um, you know, very frantic and distraught, understandably. Her daughter was there. Her daughter was still with us, so I needed her to fight. I needed her to fight for her husband and for her daughter and for the family that was still there. And that's what I kept relaying to her and to her daughter that just, you know, please fight and, um, and, and be there for the family that you have. How old was the child who died? you think? I believe around six, six, seven years old. How long did it take for the ambulances to come? Uh, initially, we had uh, uh, paramedics arrive on foot with their trauma bags, their trauma kits. Uh, when they arrived, uh, again, there were still too many wounded uh, for them to handle, so I, I, per I worked with them on applying the uh, stop the bleed tourniquets, and uh, you know, at one point I had to uh, use the trauma shears to remove her uh, her bra and her shirt because she had uh, a wound on her breast, and so I had to apply a compression bandage onto that. And um, so I was working with them. You know, they were giving me the supplies, and I was applying them while they were also working with the under wounded. But I would probably say from the time that I arrived to we actually started getting victims on to ambulances was probably the better part of uh, 10 or so minutes, uh, largely due to the fact that trying to get ambulances into an area with the possibility there still being an active shooter requires a, uh, a great deal of difficulty to not potentially cause damage or make an ambulance driver a victim. And you stayed on scene helping for, for hours, didn't you? Many hours. Yeah, I stayed there till all the patients were gone there. The patient next to the H&M who came out, and I thought I was going to have to use my pickup truck to get her out of there, but we were able to get an ambulance and get her out. Um, and then once we were escorted out, uh, I was then asked uh, by a gentleman who was there also on a voluntary basis to assist with... Uh, getting the people, the, the people off the streets so that emergency vehicles could come in and out and helping with the, the crowds of people that were coming out of the, uh, the mall that were being stationed in the grassy area there. And in, in doing that, I also, uh, you know, I had people that were approaching me that had medical conditions or were in need of water or hydration that I was working with getting them to a paramedic to assist with their medical situations or getting them water and handing out and distributing water and helping the police officers with that. Just trying to do what I could do so that the, the police officers, the fire department and the EMS could, could do the, 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 you know, the skilled jobs that they need to be there to do and I could kind of be this, this infill. Josh, I think it's just extraordinary what you did, and um, I just wonder if there's anything you want people to know about what you saw, what you went through, uh, what the others went I through. I mean, the most important thing, 
the reason I, I even agreed to 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 uh, to do these interviews because I, I I'll be honest I'm I'm pretty tired, <laughs> um, but um, was because I want people to really I want it to really sink in I want people to really and truly understand the depths of the depravity that occurred and you know and if 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 in the detail it upsets them then I'm glad because it should because it was a disastrous situation and but there were a lot of good people there uh, both civilians and of course naturally the law enforcement the paramedics the EMTs and the firefighters that just really gave it their all to uh, in a situation where it's very difficult to navigate you know in in, in those kind of conditions uh, but yeah my biggest thing is just for people to realize and under know how tragic this truly really 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 was that people lost their lives that people's lives even though they may still be alive they are forever changed and generally speaking not for the positive.